Trump Tower meeting were not with his father. But did the president know about the meeting? And we start with New Jersey Senator Cory Booker officially jumping into the 2020 presidential race. He becomes the 10th Democrat to either announce an actual run or establish an exploratory committee. Booker kicked off his campaign on social media with this message. I'm proud of not only who I am and, and my conviction, but this is a time where too many people, I think, are trying to pit people against each other, where the Democratic Party, I don't want it to be defined by what we're against, but by what we're for. If you're tired of that kind of bitterness, of that kind of trash talking, that kind of trolling, that kind of politics that is just a race to the bottom in our country, then don't support me. Because I'm not in this race to tear people down. I'm in this race to try to build our nation up. All right, and actually, let's listen to President yeah. Trump just Ten moments ago, ago at the White House. Five years ago, it's a disgrace. It's a disgrace. And now you have problems even with, I understand yesterday, even uh, people from Venezuela want to come through. Everybody wants to come through. Part of it is the success of our country, but we're going to keep our country successful. And we want people to come in. It's so important to say. We need people. We have a lot of companies moving in. A lot of companies are moving back into the United States that never thought they'd be moving back. And we need people. You see that with the jobs numbers. We really need people. Uh, but it has to be through a legal process and a process of really of merit. Uh, but we do want people coming into our country. They have to come in legally. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for being here. What you go through is incredible. And the job you do is incredible. Few people could do what you do. And we want to try and make it easier for you, or another way you could this way handle more of the incredible work. Because no matter what we do, it's not going to stop, but we can reduce it incredibly by tremendous numbers. So I just want to thank everybody for being here. And uh, we're very proud of you, very proud of the job you do. Thank you very much. And Madam Secretary, thank you very much. Really Mr. great. Mr. President. Yeah, please. Mr. Um, why not just go ahead and do the national mercy now with the well, we're building the wall now. Yeah, we're building the wall. People don't understand that. They're starting to learn. We're spending uh, a lot of money that we have on hand. It's like in a business, but we have money on hand and we're building, I would say we will have 115 miles of wall, maybe a little bit more than that very shortly. Uh, it's being built. Some of it's already been completed. And in San Diego, if you look, it's been completed. It's really beautiful, brand new. Uh, we have other wall that's under construction, and we're giving out a lot of contracts. So we're building the wall. It's getting built one way or the other. Is, it, is there another option besides the natural university? Uh, we, are, we are doing things right now. I mean, we're building it with funds that are on hand. Uh, we're negotiating very tough prices. We've designed a much better looking wall that is also actually a better wall, which is an interesting combination. It's far more beautiful. and. It's better, it's much more protective, uh, but it looks better because the walls that they used to build were not very attractive. I actually think that's possibly part of the problem, but the real problem is we need something. We have to have a very strong barrier, but we're building a lot of wall right now as we speak, and we're renovating a lot of wall, and uh, we're getting ready to give out some very big contracts with money that we have on hand and money that comes in. But we will be looking at a national emergency because I don't think anything's going to happen. I think the Democrats don't want border security. And when I hear them talking about the fact that walls are immoral and walls don't work, uh, they know they work. I watched somebody being interviewed the other day by a very good anchor. And the anchor actually was getting angrier and angrier as they tried to explain how a wall doesn't really have that much of an impact. And yet thousands of people are on one side of the wall and nobody's on the other side of the wall. Uh, it was actually laughable and really uh, horrible in, in the same breath. So uh, that's the way it is. You know, if you look at El Paso, if you look at certain places, but El Paso was one of the most dangerous cities in the whole country. Once the wall was completed, it became one of the safest immediately. It wasn't like it took five years. Some of you know this. Immediately, it became one of the safest cities in the whole country. So uh, we're building the wall. A lot of it is, I mean, the chant now should be finish the wall as opposed to build the wall, because we're building a lot of wall. And I started this six months ago. We really started going to town because I could see we're getting nowhere with the Democrats. We're not going to get anywhere with them. It's going to be a part of their campaign, but I don't think it's good politically. 
And I think Nancy Pelosi should be ashamed of herself because she's hurting a lot of people. I think the Democrats should be ashamed of themselves. Now, in all fairness to the Democrats, many of them want the wall. And I see it. They're just dying to say what they want to say. But they can't say it as, as well as they would be able to if they were allowed to do it. Yes. Mr. President, uh, so are you saying now that you believe that on February the 15th, the only option you will have left is either close down the government or yeah. declare an emergency because you don't have any faith that this committee will come up with an answer? And if you do declare an emergency, are you concerned that you will almost be immediately and be enjoined by some court in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals District? Well, we have very, very strong legal standing. It would be very hard to do that. Uh, but uh, they tend to go to the Ninth Circuit, and when they go to the Ninth Circuit, things happen. For instance, uh, the ban, it missed and then missed and then was approved in the United States Supreme Court, where we have had a very good record. Uh, they go to the Ninth Circuit in many cases, and in fact, in most cases, it has nothing to do with the Ninth Circuit. It's a shame uh, what they do. So let's see what happens. I can only tell you this, John, we have very, very strong legal standing to win. Uh, we are doing it regardless. I mean, we don't have — we haven't declared the national emergency yet, and what, yet we're building a lot of wall. We're continuing to build a lot of wall with, as we would say in business, cash on hand. And we're negotiating tough prices. We have a great system, a great wall system. It's very uniform. They used to have all these different systems. Nobody knew what was going on. We have a very good, solid system that looks good and is very powerful as a wall. But are you saying now you expect to declare a national I, I don't want to say, but you'll hear the State of the Union, and then you'll see what happens right after the State of the Union, okay? Well, are you going to wait until February 15th to do Yeah, this? we're building now. I mean, the one thing that I, I'm trying to stress to people, and I wasn't before because before it meant less, but when I see the obstruction, when I see the tremendous obstruction by Democrats, knowing that the only — the only saving of our southern border is the wall. I mean, you look at these towns. Before the wall, they were crime-ridden. And now, the wall gets built. We put up a wall in a certain area, and all of a sudden, it went from being a horrible hellhole into something that's really safe. They can't even believe it. The mayors can't even believe it. If you ever took some of the walls down in California, for instance, one story in San Diego, they were begging us to build the wall. I mean, they were putting pressure on us, that area of San Diego, where people were rampant going through. And you'd have a lot of security, but the security can only do so much. When, as an example, when you have these caravans that are going to be hitting, we were, we've done a great job with the caravans, an incredible job. And most of them have gone back where they're staying on the other side of a wall. They haven't been coming in for the most part. But we've done a great job. We don't have the ammunition because we don't have the barrier. But it's been really amazing to see the difference when you have it and when you don't. It's incredible to see the difference of an area on the other side of a barrier. So, you know, the old expression, walls work, whether you like it or not. In Israel, they have a wall, and it was 99, it is 99.9% .9 successful. And ours are too. When we, when we have it, we're going to be starting in a certain way. We have a, a few of them, a few areas that we're starting where they catch up. Once you have the holes in the middle, they just spread sort of like water. They just spread in. But you have to have it. So when you talk about the committee, uh, I can tell you the Republicans want to have a wall, but the Democrats are told that you can't do that. They are doing a tremendous ser disservice. The Democrats are doing a tremendous disservice to our country. You heard today about human trafficking. Human trafficking can go down by a tremendous percentage if we had a wall on our southern border. Tremendous. Because it's very hard to do human trafficking through ports of entry. Because you have people standing there looking and they say, hey, what's going on in the back seat? What's going on in the trunk? They check these things. So they come into areas where you don't have the barriers. And we're not going to let that happen. So we're building a lot of it. We'll be up to about 115 miles of, of uh, wall, some renovated, some new. And we're going to make a big step in the next uh, week or so prior to my doing anything. But actually having a national emergency does help the process. It would certainly help the process. What would help a lot would be if the Democrats could actually be honest and approve. They're not being honest. Everybody knows they're not being honest. They know they're not being honest. I'd like to hear what they talk about in their rooms when they go back. 
And I tell you what, a lot of pressure is being put on by Democrats, uh, being put on their leadership. Tremendous pressure is being put on because they cannot justify not having a barrier between our country and Mexico. Mexico just came out yesterday. Numbers were just released. 38,000 people were murdered in Mexico, up like a, an incredible amount, 30 percent or something from the year before. 38,000 people were murdered in Mexico. It's one of the most, unfortunately, unsafe countries in the world. We need a protective barrier for our country. And that doesn't include Honduras, who we are not happy with, and we're looking very seriously at taking away all funding. And same thing for Guatemala, and the same thing for El Salvador. It's a disgrace what's going on in those countries. For years and years, the United States has paid them hundreds of millions of dollars, and they do nothing for us. When a caravan starts in the middle of Honduras, obviously, they're allowing it to start. And they want it to start because they want to not have certain people in their country. So what do they do? They put them in the caravan. And we've had tremendous numbers of criminals that we've caught in the caravans before they get here. So uh, the committee is uh, — I know the Republicans want to do something. And I'm not saying it because I'm a Republican. I'm saying the Democrats are instructed, don't do all. And they're only doing that. You hear about human trafficking, drugs, gangs, crime. They're only doing it for one very simple reason. It's one simple reason. Couldn't be simpler, because they think it's good politics for 2020. Because they say, maybe we can beat Trump because this is a big issue. Now, I've done a lot of other issues. I've done military, where we've — our military is in great shape now. It's strong and ready. It was totally depleted when I got here. Regulation cuts, tax cuts. I mean, we've done more than any other president has ever done in the first two years of his presidency. But uh, the wall is a big factor, and they want to use the wall for politics. So it's not going to work because we're building the wall, and it's under construction. Yes, sir. Mr. President, have you privately decided whether or not you will declare a national emergency? And just to clarify, have I privately? You yeah, know, you what's in my mind? In well, mind. certainly thinking about it. You're thinking ahead. I, I think there's a good chance that we'll have to do that, uh, but uh, <coughs> we will uh, at the same time be building. Regardless, we're building wall, and we're building a lot of wall. But I could do it a lot faster the other way. Are you saying that you will — that we should be prepared for you to announce at the State of the Union what you are going to Well, I'm saying listen closely to the State of the Union. I think you'll find it very exciting. Can we get a as well question real quick? Yeah. Um, are, are you willing to commit U.S. military, if necessary, to uh, force the Rose? No, I don't want to say that. But it's always an option. Everything's an option. I take no options off the table. Okay? Thank you. Mr. President, are you thinking of adding on a meeting with Xi Jinping on the back end or the front end? Yeah, I'm Kim? thinking about it. I'm, I'm supposed, I'm supposed I mean, some of you were there yesterday. Uh, we had an incredible meeting yesterday with the, uh, the Vice Premier of China, a very powerful man, highly respected, very, uh, very strong, very respected also by the President, President Xi. And uh, we had an amazing meeting on trade, mostly on trade, actually also on fentanyl. Uh, China's agreed to criminalize <laughs> fentanyl. That's going to have a huge impact on fentanyl coming into the country. So but we, there is a possibility we'll meet somewhere, whether it's there. I'm over in a certain location. I'll be over in a certain location there, as you know. So you might do it too. And that'll be announced officially probably next week. So, so you might do it too. It could happen. Country. It's it kind of like the name for that summit, sir. Is that, is that a good guess? Gee. Dun Nang. Who does Dun Nang remind me of, huh? Certain, certain senator. It's a certain senator that said he was a war hero when he wasn't. He okay, never I saw Dun Nang. Have you found the money to, pay, to build the wall? And you do that too? Well, we have a lot of money, and that's why we're building it. I mean, we have a lot of money. Don't forget, we had a billion six approved. Then we had another billion six approved. Now, in theory, we have a billion three approved. But we're renovating a lot of walls that were basically dilapidated. In some cases, we're rent it's called a renovation, but it's really much more. It's a wall that is in such bad shape that we take it down and we build new wall in certain very important areas. But we're doing a combination of renovation and new wall. But we're doing a lot of it. But do you, Mr. President, do you need um, an appropriation from Congress or a national emergency to build all, all the wall you think is necessary? Uh, we're already appropriated. We have a lot of appropriation. It's already been done. And certain other things we'll be doing that we haven't done yet. 
And one of the things we're considering, obviously, is a national emergency. And it is. It's an invasion of our country, of not only people, not only gangs and criminals and human traffickers. It's an invasion of drugs into our country. It's an invasion like you've never seen before. You talk about heroin. Ninety percent of the heroin coming into our country comes in through the southern border. We can stop so much of that. And I'll tell you this. If we build a proper barrier with all of the technology, which only really works with the barrier, but if we build a proper barrier with great technology, too, uh, we will see crime throughout the United States go down in percentages that we've never seen before. It'll be an amazing thing, because so much of it comes through the southern border. Mr. President, to follow, can you tell us some of the themes that are important to you in the State of the Union speech? I, I think most of the themes you would know. It's economic development, it's success, it's, I mean, no country has had the success that we've had over the last two years. And I will say this, if the other party got into office, instead of being up and having these phenomenal 304,000 jobs added, and we had so many great months, and, you know, it's been a little bit tricky because I'm in the middle of some very big trade deals, which is disruptive before you make it. But after you make it, those deals are much better than they were before. I don't even mean much better. I mean, better like nobody's ever seen before. That includes a deal, if we make the deal with China, you're talking about, it'll be a different world for us. We lost $500 billion a year with China for many years. 500 billion, not million, 500 billion. We're not gonna do that anymore. And our relationship with China is extraordinary. My relationship with the president, she is better, I guarantee, than any relationship of a president and a president. It's not even close, but it can't go on this way. We can't allow this to happen. And if you notice yesterday, and I think it was a big story, or it should have been, but China, as a sign of goodwill, has agreed to purchase a tremendous, massive amount of soybeans and other agricultural product. Our farmers this morning are very happy. I spoke to Sonny Perdue, Secretary of Agriculture. He called me this morning. Our farmers are extremely happy. Mr. President, in, in Texas, where you want to build about 168 miles of wall, you can't build the wall on right on the border. You've got to build it off the floodplain. Right. So you may slow down human traffickers, you may slow down drug runners, you may slow down people who don't want to get caught. But for all these tens of thousands of Central American migrants who just want to touch foot on U.S. soil and wait for the Border Patrol to pick them up, how does building new walls solve that problem? Well, we're going to solve the problem, and we're also working on different things because there's so many loopholes. You're right. Touch the land, all of a sudden it's a catch and release deal. They become, they go into the country, and in some cases, if they're criminals, you, they're released into our country. It's a ridiculous thing. It's a loophole. And if you look at the visa lottery, and if you look at all of these other chain migration, we have to fix all of it, John. It's very important. The wall is is the most important thing by far, but we have to fix the loopholes. You're 100 percent right. So, okay, yeah, please. Nancy Pelosi says you're risking an arms race with Russia today. What's your answer? Say it again. Nancy Pelosi says you're risking a, a new arms race with Russia. Okay. What's your answer? Uh, honestly, I don't think she has a clue. I really don't. I don't think Nancy has a clue. And I see that when she says walls are immoral. She doesn't have, uh, she doesn't know. And, and I wish she did, because uh, she's hurting this country so badly. It's all rhetorical, not delivered well, but it's all rhetorical. She's hurting our country very, very badly, even with statements like that. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Let's go, let's go, let's go. All right, guys, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Go ahead, Pulling out of the IMF, is this as much about the threat in the Western Pacific from China? Is it the emerging threat from China? No, the reason is, the reason is, first of all, you have to add countries, obviously. It's old. But very importantly, one side has not been adhering to it. We have, but one side hasn't. So unless they're going to adhere, we shouldn't be the only one. Uh, I hope that we're able to get everybody in a very big and beautiful room and do a new treaty that would be much better. But, because uh, certainly I would like to see that. But you have to have everybody adhere to it. And you have a certain side that uh, almost pretends it doesn't exist. Pretty much pretends it doesn't exist. So unless we're going to have something that we all agree to, we can't be put at the disadvantage of going by a treaty, limiting what we do when somebody else doesn't go by that.
treaty. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, you're looking at President Trump there at the White House just moments ago where he where he's uh, having a meeting there with Homeland Security officials and citizens who are uh, combating human trafficking. I want to bring in CNN political director David Chalian and A.B. Stoddard from Real Clear Politics with us. Some interesting takeaways, guys, here. Um, one seemed to be that here, even two weeks out from this deadline for Congress to negotiate a deal, the president wants the wall, Democrats do not, but trying to work out a deal to avert another government shutdown, he's totally dismissing it, and it seems like he's gearing up to announce a national emergency at his State of the Union address. I, I think he was telegraphing that uh, quite clearly uh, in the moment that he was saying, yeah, he's likely going to have to do the national emergency. And then he urged the reporter to really tune in and focus uh, on the State of the Union. That that seems to suggest to me he's revealing a little bit about what he intends to announce at the State of the Union. I, I think we've seen now for the last 36 hours, Nancy Pelosi and Donald Trump are sort of dug in where, where they are on this. And so uh, what is clear by saying and sort of laying the groundwork to go to national emergency to me is that Donald Trump is very keenly aware that the shutdown was not a positive for him in any way whatsoever and wants to avoid that again come February 15th. There are a few problems with the national emergency. It might be his only climb down, but it's not an emergency if you are building the wall. He's just sat there for a very long time and told us how much wall is being rehabbed, very good torn point. down, yeah. and, and completely rebuilt anew. We have all this money. And now he's going to say it's an emergency. He's, I know it's the caravans are creating the emergency, but it sounds like he's found enough money and he's got enough wall rehabbed and also freshly built that he's mitigated the threat. So it's going to be bizarre to see him get up if he ends, ends up carrying through this plan. And, and those and arguments, I think, will be in, in court, In a state of the right? union. Yeah. And then, and then it, yes, it will definitely be challenged in court. He's not likely to prevail. But this is very tough for Republicans. I mean, you've really seen them after the shutdown. They're not going to shut the government down again. If he ever balked two weeks from now, they, I think they would send him a spending bill uh, in defiance of this. They, um, Senator Cornyn announced this week that Texas is no sure win for the pre Republican president in 2020 and that his party is alarmed there. Um, looking at the numbers. I just think that he's putting them, the, Congress is a co-equal branch. They are opposed to the national uh, declaration of an emergency. This is going to receive some pushback. There might be yep. resolutions on the House and Senate floor uh, to disprove of, of a national emergency. I mean, this is going to bring, this is going to be a huge political show for him. It's we've, not an easy out off ramp. We've heard Republicans saying they don't want the national emergency, as you point out. Uh, can we, let's talk about his characterization of the wall, because he is, he wants the money for the wall to build the wall but now it sort of sounds like he's saying the wall's already being built and the mantra is finish the wall but let's just be clear about this because he's there are some renovations he's trying to argue that some of them are so extensive it's basically New tantamount to knocking down a it's house a and rebuild yeah it, right? exactly uh but that's not the wall that's certainly not the wall he campaigned on every single day in 2015 and 2016. The, the, the slogan was not finish the wall, touch ups and restoration. <laughs> that, they, that, that, that was not it. That so, doesn't sound good so now that you say it. So he is clearly trying to move in a way to find his fig leaf on the wall that he can then use to say he got the wall. But what he was talking about today, there's so much wall there already, finish the wall. That, that is not at all the the wall across the southern border being paid for by Mexico that he was promising the American people. No, not at all. It'll be really interesting to see. You saw in conservative media after the shutdown, they were split, right? You saw Ann Coulter and others really lashing out at him. And then other people like Sean Hannity saying he's going to get the money in the next three weeks. So it'll be interesting to see where his allies are and how Senate Republicans, especially the ones up in 2020, explain whatever the fig leaf, you know, turns out to be. But he's basically, the Congress does have the power of the purse. They're supposed to decide how these funds are spent and how to reopen the government or keep it, keep the funding bills um, covered until the end of the fiscal year. And they also don't want a national emergency. So this is not going to end today because he's decided to pretend it's all great. No, it is not. A.B. Stoddard, David Challion, it means we'll have you back again very soon. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. So as the president talked, uh, his aides were talking about the latest entry to the presidential race. Here is the first word from the White House on Senator Cory Booker putting his hat in the ring. I think Cory Booker often sounds like a Hallmark card and not uh, necessarily a, a, a person who's there to tell you everything he's accomplished in the United States Senate and as mayor of Newark. So we'll wait to look at his record. I imagine that 
the crowded Democratic field of presidential aspirants will be attacking each other's records or lack thereof. So we'll be sitting back with copious bowls of popcorn watching that. Andrew Gillum is a CNN political commentator and former Florida candidate for governor. Uh, Mayor, thanks for being with us. Of course. Thanks for so much for having me, uh, Brianna. I hope you're well. Oh, I am well. Thank you. And so this primary battle that we're going to see, well, first off, can you just react uh, to to what we're hearing from Kellyanne Conway? Because as you see this inter-party battle that we're expecting to see, sure, maybe that's something the White House wants to celebrate. But it's also, aside from just being kind of a cage fight, there's an element of political Darwinism here, right, where it's going to <laughs> challenge Democrats to get better. We've seen that before when there have been large, uh, large uh, primary fields. And I, I wonder if maybe that would be less welcome to the White House. What do you think about what she was saying there? Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, we are continuing to add to the field of what I think are extremely capable and qualified and I think even inspirational figures uh, competing for the White House. Clearly, uh, Senator Booker is carving a lane, um, frankly, of contrast between him. Um, uh, the last 18 minutes of, of what we heard from the president, uh, more derision, more division, division, building walls, separating people. Um, but his contrast isn't by going to Twitter or to social media and trading barbs. Uh, it is by basically casting a bigger vision, a wider vision, a more inclusive vision, trying to help Americans see what we share in common. Uh, I think it's going to be an interesting strategy as he continues uh, uh, on the pathway here uh, toward uh, toward the nomination. Uh, but Mr. Booker um, will be, I think, uh, a candidate who will uh, weave a very inspirational line in one where he's not going to be afraid to talk about his record, not only well, in the United States Senate, but also as a former mayor. So what do you think when you hear Kellyanne Conway dismissing that as a Hallmark card? Well, I mean, first of all, when you have to represent a White House uh, that only knows what it means to divide Americans, uh, where they only go to uh, gutter politics and politics of derision and division. Uh, of course, uh, it sounds uh, a little hokey to their ears when you hear a candidate saying there's more that brings us together than that, than that divides us. When you hear a candidate uh, trying to appeal to the higher aspirations of people. What I think Mr. Booker, Senator Booker, as well as the other candidates so far uh, who have been entrenched into this race are clear about is that they're not going to go to the gutter with this president. Uh, they're not going to compete with him in the gutter, not him, not his White House, not his staff. Uh, they're going to go directly to the American people and remind us, uh, of, frankly, uh, of a higher calling. Uh, and I have to applaud them on that. I don't think that we're going to win in the gutter with this president. That's where he thrives. It's going to be important always to take, uh, I think, this conversation to a higher level. Cory Booker uh, declaring his candidacy on the first day of Black History Month, Kamala Harris. Mm declaring her candidacy on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, it, it strikes me that then Senator Barack Obama was a little more careful about how he was emphasizing his heritage when he first campaigned. I, I wonder what you think that if, if uh, having already seen the first African-American president, the first black president, does that affect uh, these candidates as they're choosing their coming out of the gate message and really uh, emphasizing their racial heritage? Well, I'll tell you, uh, uh, both these candidates, um, Senator uh, Harris as well as Senator Booker, uh, did choose historic moments to make their entrance into the race. But I don't think anybody's going to be able to put uh, either of them into a singular uh, box. Uh, they're not running to be the first uh, black woman president or the second African-American president of the United States in Mr. Booker's case. Uh, they really have appeal across uh, these demographic lines and demographic barriers. Um, uh, they're going to be talking about issues and I think they're going to try to highlight the issues that again allow us to bring uh, each other uh, together. Uh, the other thing that I think this electorate is, 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 is interested in is candidates who are going to run as themselves. There's no sense in pretending uh, that Kamala Harris is not um, a, a black woman. There's no sense in, in attempting to ignore the fact that Mr. Booker will bring a set of experiences uh, as, a, as a black 
man in this race, but they are not running uh, on that as a theme uh, for the presidency. They're not hiding from it either. But I think what we're going to hear from these candidates over the long haul will be, what are those issues? Health care, education, criminal justice. Uh, how is it that we're going to reach even Trump voters who thought they were going to get a president who was going to advocate for their advancement, a better check for them, and instead he's only been a champion for himself? Uh, these candidates are, will be well advised to, I think, uh, again, talk to the American people about uh, themselves as well as how it is that they're going to advance a greater vision and improve on our individual lives and not their own. Andrew Gillum, thank you, sir, so much for being with us. Of course. Of course. Thanks for having me. Of course, anytime. New fears of an arms race after the U.S. suspends its nuclear treaty with Russia, plus former CIA director Leon Panetta will join me next to react to the president claiming that his intel chiefs were misquoted even though they were not. And we're awaiting Roger. This is CNN Breaking News. But, but my God, it does no good to sign an agreement if a party's not going to comply with it. The, the, the piece of paper, if it's not being complied with, is, doesn't reduce the risk. It doesn't take down that threat to the people around the world. The, the INF document today is being violated by the Russians. That is the very agreement that they signed up for. We, we didn't force them into the agreement. They, they decided this was in their best interest. They've now decided it's not in their best interest. Former Defense Secretary and CIA Director Leon Panetta is joining us now. Sir, thank you so much for being with us. Good to be with you, Brianna. So this treaty, uh, it, it's, a, it's a centerpiece. It's been a centerpiece of European security since the Cold War. What happens without it? Well, there's a real concern, and a lot of people, I'm sure, are very nervous, particularly in Europe, uh, about uh, whether or not, as a result of getting rid of this treaty, uh, we're going to begin a new arms race uh, on, on nuclear weapons. Uh, we, we have made a lot of progress on that through the START agreements, through the INF Treaty. Uh, we thought we were headed in, a, in the right direction. Look, there's no question that the Russians have been violating this treaty. They're deploying uh, cruise missiles, I think battalions of these cruise missiles, uh, along their border. But at the same time, uh, this administration doesn't have a very good record of getting rid of treaties and then replacing them with something that's even better. And that's what makes people very nervous. We just heard President Trump, and he was saying when asked about this uh, at the White House, he said that this essentially this does need to be renegotiated. You're saying there isn't a good record of that. But he says they need to get in a big, beautiful room. He said other countries like China need to be brought in. What do you say to that? Well, you know, I, I, I... I don't think that's a bad thing to uh, try to sit down and try to get uh, our allies and Russia to join together uh, to uh, try to develop uh, a treaty that everybody will abide by. Uh, but again, there's not a good track record here. Uh, this administration pulled out of the climate change uh, agreement. Uh, there's been nothing that replaced it. Uh, they pulled out of the uh, trade agreement with the South, uh, South Asian uh, nations. Uh, nothing's replaced that. Uh, they pulled out of the Iran agreement. Uh, nothing's replaced that. Uh, and so there's a real question mark as to whether or not they have a strategy for really putting in place something better. And that's what makes people nervous. I want to get your perspective as a uh, former CIA director about what we've seen playing out that's really extraordinary with the intel chiefs. Uh, they testified publicly uh, on camera. Indispu indisputably contradicting the president's claims about ISIS and North Korea and Iran, and yet the president is disputing the characterization that they're not in lockstep with him. How do you think that these heads of intel agencies view all of this? How would you view it if you were still CIA director? <laughs> well, well, it has to be really disconcerting because, uh, you know, these intelligence agencies have an obligation uh, to speak truth to power, and that's exactly what they did. Uh, and when the president uh, rejects what they've said because it doesn't somehow agree with his version of the world, uh, then he not only attacks them, but now he's saying that they were misquoted. Uh, the reality is that if, if this president is going to face uh, the tough decisions that presidents have to face, they have to rely on intelligence. 
It has to be good intelligence. It has to be truthful intelligence. And when he rejects it, it sends a real message to the world that we now have a president who's basically operating on his own and not listening to the people that really know what's going on. These are figures who generally, I mean, we did see them testify as they do annually uh, before Congress, but in general, they keep a pretty low profile. I mean, these are intelligence chiefs. So when the president then characterizes their sentiments uh, from his his characterization, to be clear, which is, is sort of dubious, that they believe uh, the, the daylight between themselves and the president to be fake news, uh, is that really problematic? Do you think that people dismiss that? Or do you worry that that is a, a bad situation? Because obviously they're not in the kind of position where you would refute that publicly. Well, it's a terrible situation uh, to have a president who rejects the information he receives from the intelligence people that he's appointed to those positions. And yes, they are low key. Uh, that's the way they're supposed to be. Uh, because their responsibility is to present to the president uh, the intelligence about what is happening in the world. Uh, we have a president who doesn't want to listen to the truth uh, because he has his own version of that. Uh, he said that uh, ISIS was defeated. Uh, our intelligence chief said that's not the case, uh, that there are thousands that uh, are continuing to work. That's the fact. Uh, this president says that uh, Iran is cheating on the nuclear agreement. Uh, our intelligence official says that's not the case. Uh, the president rejects that because it doesn't agree with his version of what's going on. Same thing about Russia, the same thing about other issues, particularly on border security. He says it's a, a national emergency uh, and our intelligence chiefs uh, don't put it at the top really of the major threats that we're confronting in this world. So the danger here is to have a president who has his version of what he thinks should be true. And basically, it's what he wants the world to look like. Well, the purpose of intelligence is to tell you what the world is, not what he wants it to look like. Sir, thank you so much, Leon Panetta. We really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Longtime Trump advisor and confidant Roger Stone arrived to court just moments ago. So